Today we will talk about normalization. Normalization is the process of making equality easier to decide by choosing a good representative for each equivalence class. For example, suppose we are interested in checking whether two arrays are the same up to permutation. It could be challenging to check all possible mappings between their elements. Can we do better? One idea is to sort these arrays first so that we can easily check the equality. If the original arrays are equivalent up to permutation, then they will become identical after the sorting. The sorted arrays, in this case, are the normal form. A sorting algorithm normalizes an arbitrary array into a sorted array, and the sorting itself is normalization. Sorting makes sense as normalization because of the two reasons. First, sorted arrays are equal to the original arrays. The sorting algorithm picks a representative that is still equivalent to the input. Second, it trivializes the equality checking by carefully choosing representatives. In this case, it turns any two equivalent arrays into identical ones. In type theory, instead of arrays, we are interested in whether two terms are judgmentally equal. We want to normalize equal terms to literally the same term. Why do we care? From a theoretical perspective, you can easily derive the consistency of a type theory from a reasonable normalization theorem. You can also check whether you forgot to say some terms should be judgmentally equal. Moreover, type checking, unification, etc., all rely on the ability to confirm two things are equal. Conversely, once you have a good normalization algorithm. It's usually not far from implementing these routines. Therefore, normalization is not only attractive as an intellectual exercise, but also crucial to build any practical tool. Let's check how it works for the simply typed lambda calculus, which has the units, the empty type, functions, pairs, and disjoint sums. We want to design a way to normalize two expressions so that equal terms become identical. How should we design such a process? Let's check the rules defining judgmental equality. First, the beta rule for functions. If there is a lambda function applying to some argument, it's equal to the substitution. You want to identify both terms, and it seems reasonable to reduce the left hand side to the right hand side. It's actually impossible to go the other way. There are also beta rules saying that the projection applying to a pair is equal to the corresponding component. Finally, there are two beta rules about the case analysis applying to an element from a known constructor. In all cases, the direction is going from the left to the right. So the first approximation is to run the terms using these computation rules, also known as beta rules. Until we are stuck, note that the judgmental equality is a congruence, and thus we should recursively run terms under the binders. We are going to be stuck on constructors such as the diamond, in left of the diamond, and the identity function lambda x star x. We will also be stuck on variables or eliminators on variables such as the first of x, and x of y of z. Where the variable x at the critical location blocks further computation, are we done? No, we still have to consider the uniqueness rules, also known as eta rules. Remember that a function f is the same as lambda x star f of x, but neither will be reduced to the other by the beta rules. Another instance is a term p of a pair type. According to the uniqueness rule. P is equal to the pair of its first and second projections. Yet another example is the unit type. The uniqueness rule says any element of it is judgmentally equal to the diamond. One way to achieve this is to expand terms of these types to the more elaborated forms after running them. That is, we always write down a function using the lambda abstraction, a pair as a pair of two components. And replace anything of the unit type with the diamond.
So it seems reasonable to have some mechanism to run the beta rules and do the expansion using the ATAT rules. This consideration led to a powerful normalization technique called normalization by evaluation. It works for a wide range of type theories. There are exactly two steps, the evaluation operation that reduces a term using the beta rules and the verification operation that expands the reduced terms using the ATAR rules. I'm not the one who started using this fancy word for ATAR expansion, but we will see why it's called verification soon. There are many optimizations we can apply to the process. First of all, we might re-evaluate the function body more than once. Think about the application of lambda x dot m to n. It's likely that we normalize the function body m before the function application and then re-normalize it after the substitution. Can we evaluate the function body only once? One solution is to hold the evaluation under the binder until you know the actual argument. The addition of delayed evaluation suggests a separate domain different from the original calculus. The evaluation and verification phases become intertwined because the expansion during verification could trigger delayed evaluation. A separate domain turns out to be useful for other optimizations as well. For example, it facilitates representing variables by their positions in the context. A nameless scheme is attractive because handling variable shadowing is otherwise painful. However, you might have to shift all the numbers whenever you move a term into a different context. The good news is that we can avoid shifting by indexing the variables from the right of the context in the original calculus, but from the left in the domain. The two indexing schemes are called De Bruyne indexes and levels, respectively, named after the Dutch mathematician Nicolas Hofert de Bruyne. By the way, with a separate domain, it also makes sense to call the second stage verification. It constructs an actual term out of something from the domain. Alright, so this seems to be working for simply type lambda calculus, and we can apply various optimizations. But how about the cubical type theory? The additional complexity brought by cubical type theory is that we have actual equalities specified by boundaries. For example, suppose P is a path from M to N. Intuitively, we want to reduce P at 0 to M and P at 1 to N. However, this is neither a beta reduction nor an eta expansion. Even worse, the term P at i for some dimension variable i is usually stuck, but if there is a constraint i equals to 0 or i equals to 1 in the context, it should reduce to m or n accordingly. Another case is the loop constructor in the circle type. Loop i is usually a value unless there is a constraint i equals to 0 or i equals to 1. It's still under active research to incorporate these rules into the normalization by evaluation framework. To summarize, by composing the evaluation and verification steps, we can normalize equal terms to identical expressions. The method we presented was called normalization by evaluation. There are also other ways to normalize a term, such as hereditary substitution, but that will be another lecture. As for cubical type theory, we already have some ideas but are still working on it. That's all for today. Please remember to vote on the topics. Bye.